Um, we, um, we've been looking at uh, some of the results of Sarah's um, oppression of Hagar. And uh, so what I'm going to do is, um, let's see, I'm just going to read because there is a really, there's a fair chance that we could finish this chapter tonight, and if not, probably next week, which is the same for other classes. Oh, well, great. No, you come up because you're the representative of God. Uh, we are uh, going into break week next week, so there'll be no classes all next week. Okay? okay. Well, that will be refreshing for y'all. I was going to say, you know, if me, Jim, and, and Mike died, that would be pretty rough on the church, but for the wives, it'd be great. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> they go on a cruise. Uh huh. <clears throat> All right, so I'm just going to read this so we can see if we can get her done. Uh, in the future, Sarah will have many problems. Uh, I read this last time, and I want to just, you know how I do. <clears throat> in the future, Sarah will have many problems taking place among her grand great grandchildren. Joseph was the beloved son of Jacob, or Israel. The way Sarah felt towards Hagar's seed is the way Joseph's brothers felt concerning him. Uh-oh. How many of you believe you can actually reap what you sow? Okay. Good. Because it's in the Bible. And we believe the Bible. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> the... Um, Let's see, it was as if Joseph was bringing forth the true firstborn son and that the brothers were barren. And that was, in, in a sense, that and that wasn't exact, but in a sense, that that time when, you know, Sarah was oppressing Hagar, she was barren. She couldn't bring forth the, the firstborn. And... Um, so then when, when uh, Hagar got pregnant, she was, and of course that wasn't the, the firstborn son, she didn't know that, you know? I mean, the stuff that we don't know, that can cause us to react and to say and do things that really, if we knew the bigger picture, we would, you know, keep our mouth shut. <laughs> Wait on the Lord, right? <clears throat> All right. So... Um, they were older than he, and their reactions were as the elder son to the prodigal. And when the latter born too was given a, a robe, this is talking about Joseph still, the coat of many colors, um, <clears throat> then they really got jealous because the father was honoring Joseph as the firstborn. Okay. In Joseph's case, anger turns to contemplating murder. Instead, they decided to sell him to foreigners. It just so happens that Joseph is sold to Ishmaelites, which is the seed of Ishmael, Hagar's firstborn, and taken down into Egypt, which was Hagar. All right, let's see. Now, I didn't read this last time. Sarah's abuse of Hagar was due to jealousy over her seed, which was Ishmael, okay, and again, see, if you knew the future or if you knew the Lord and you knew his heart and you knew the way he worked, you wouldn't be jealous over Ishmael, right? You wouldn't do it. You, you, you would be with the Lord. You say, I'm with the Lord, you know, but you, you know, if you're not, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're basing things on how they appear, um, because God doesn't go by that, right? God looketh, the man looketh upon the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. Um, then you would, you would know certain things. You would realize certain things. And, um, and if you didn't realize those things, you would still learn not to move so quickly, not to react so quickly, 
wait on the Lord. I mean, that, that earns you dividends in the long run. Uh, I, I heard on the news tonight, they said something about uh, that Apple is fixing to, to make a thing where if you send a text and then you go, oh, I, either I didn't mean to send that to this person or oh, I shouldn't have sent that, that you can actually retrieve it before, you know, before it gets to them. You know, well, we can't do that in the Lord. We have to learn to trust him. We have to learn to be with him. I mean, it's not just learning Christianity, is it? Is it really just learning Christianity? No. We're learning Christ, and we're learning the Father, and we're learning the Holy Spirit, and we've entered into, you know, that's our, that's our family now. We've been taken into the family of God right but we don't act like you know we don't act like we're in the family we act like you know orphans outsiders <clears throat> and that's because we haven't learned the family spirit so anyway um uh, the story becomes further uh, connected to sarah's harshness when joseph is taken down to egypt by ishmael and now he the seed of abraham becomes the servant of the egyptians He's taken down, and he becomes, well, you know, it, in, uh, first he was put in Potiphar's house, and then he was framed, and then he's, he ends up in prison. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, it is a complete reversal. Um, and it, it's a reversal in several different ways, and one is that God's, God speaks to us sometimes directly, sometimes through words that we hear from the Lord. Um, sometimes people tell us things. But, you know, I learned, and I don't know if this is worth anything, but I learned pretty early that people would, back when I was your age, and I was, people were prophesying over you all the time. It was such a big deal. You know, and people go, and the Lord's going to do this, and, and the Lord's going to do that. And I thought, no wonder I'm going bald. But anyway, you know, all of that was going on, and I learned pretty quick to go, you know, I just went, you know what? If that was really God speaking, I don't believe I have to figure it out to make it work. You know, that that's... That's him. He's saying that's going to come to pass. So I'm not going to try to figure it out. I'm going to let him do it. And one day I'll go, well, there it is. But if it's not the Lord, I'll one day look and go, they said by the time I was 40, I would, you know, take over the world. <laughs> and I can't even take over myself yet. <clears throat> um. So he is now in the place of Hagar. Joseph is now in the place of Hagar. He, except for instead of, because Abraham and Sarah represented Israel. And they had a slave, a servant and a slave named Hagar that was an Egyptian. And now Israel in the person of Joseph is a servant to the Egyptians, see? And that's a complete reversal because of what? Because of why? Chance, um, you know, the, the good old God's, well, God's just trying to teach me something. Well, that's for sure. I don't know if he's using that, but God's definitely trying to teach you something. <coughs> But it may go back further than you would think. In this case, Sarah and Hagar. Israel in the person of Sarah and Hagar in the person of the Egyptians and her oppression. And so Joseph, Joseph could say, well, I don't know why this is happening to me. And he probably did. But eventually he understood that God meant it for good, even if his brother's motives were wrong. 
<clears throat> even if, see, no, 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 I don't accept anything unless everybody's motive's perfect. Almost nobody's motives are perfect, <laughs> you know. I mean, I say almost. We have a few in this classroom right now that are, but other than those special people. Um, <clears throat> so he is, Joseph, he is now in the place of Hagar and must endure harsh and oppressive treatment, just like Sarah dealt to Hagar. But later in Genesis 45, so I'm going to read Genesis 45, verse 4 through 5. <clears throat> and maybe I did read this last time. I don't know. Uh, Genesis 45, 4 and 5. So you could say 45, 45, but it's not. It's... Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, <clears throat> I am Joseph, your brother. Now, I think his motive for saying your brother was, you know, because he could have just said, I'm Joseph. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Give him the, what do you think of that, dudes? <clears throat> I'm your brother. You see that? He's, a, he's got a completely different spirit. Whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved. See there is no. You know. We go well. I learned the Lord. But those people were all so mean. And that, you know. And you know. God will get them. I'm sorry. That is not the spirit of the lamb. That's not how it works. That's not his spirit. It's not endure. Just endure. First of all. We're supposed to be overcomers. And it is to be with the Lord. And is it possible to be with the Lord in really trying situations? Is it? Well, don't say yes unless, because you will face trying situations. And you will be on his side and his part. He will be expecting you to be with him. But, you know, but we don't if, if things don't line up because we believe um, uh, we believe that if that we will forgive them if they show that they're really sorry. You know, now if they're if you're really sorry, oh, yes, oh, I forgive you. Yes, come here, take come some of my coronavirus. <clears throat> you know, now go. Um, you know, we have ugly motives going on in us, and they're nothing like Jesus, and yet we go, well, I was the offended party, so I must be the Jesus of this situation. There's no the Jesus of this situation. There's only him, his life, his nature within us. It's just him. It's not us being him. It's him being him, and we go with that. We say yes. We say yes. I say yes to you, you know? And, um, you know, we talked about this many times, but um, is it possible that you want to go with the Lord and you, you say yes to the Lord, but you do have stuff in you that's not settled and not right? Yeah. Well, what do you do? Well, I want to be Jesus. Well, I want to hold on to my, <laughs> you know, my, my anger and my unforgiveness because you deserve it. Well, I need Jesus. <laughs> you know. Well, it's possible to have both, but it is possible to say, but I want the Lord and I want whatever is not taken over inside of me I want him to take over you know I want him to take over I want him to be the life I want him uh, uh, I want the words I speak to be not my own but his and the works that I do be not my own but his so that I don't get 
high and mighty and think that I'm something because of what I've done, but I, I'm with the Lord. And it's really that simple. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's not that simple to just get rid of everything, but it is really that simple that <clears throat> um, if, you can, if you can point your heart to the Lord for five minutes, you'll get more ground than you can by just praying, oh, Lord, someday. You know what I mean? Give him, give him what you can. Give him what you can. <clears throat> now, in, in Joseph's case, I believe that this is what God really wants. What God really wants <clears throat> is he wants that spirit, that family spirit, the spirit that, you know, because it is a family. I mean, there was a, before there was a world, there was a father. You know, I mean, think about that. You know, he wasn't an engineer or, you know, something like that. He, he was... He was a father, and he had a son, and we've been brought into that union and <clears throat> that oneness, and so it's a family, and that's why I refer to it as a family spirit. And this is also why we can't seem to ever end one of these classes, because I just keep going without notes and stuff. But you see what I'm saying. I mean, this is <clears throat> Joseph went through it. I I promise you he had phases where he was not in tune with the Lord. I promise you. I promise you that there were, that's, that's the truth. <clears throat> but he didn't quit. He didn't quit. He said, I'm, I'm going to keep pressing in. And look at his circumstances. I mean, from his brothers doing that to Potiphar's house. Potiphar's house wasn't bad. I mean, do you get? Do you ever get the feeling that it was like really, really bad? No, I always felt like, well, this is a pretty nice place landing, you know, here, and <clears throat> you know, you got this fine-looking babe. I'm kidding, I am kidding. <laughs> but it's it's like you know. But then, what happens after that? Worse and worse and worse and worse and dungeon, and then, you know, finally, you know, he. Um, uh, it, it's, as, it's as low as you can get. And whatever, however, when he came, when he was brought out of that dungeon, Pharaoh said, I'm going to call you Zaphnath Paneah, the man whom, to whom God will reveal himself. Oh, my God, may I, you know, may you, may we say, I want to know him so well that God, you know, they're all going, well, now what's the explanation for this, you know? And, well, we got a slave down in the dungeon, and I think he might be able to handle this. <clears throat> and the Pharaoh said that of him. He had all these wise, quote, unquote, wise guys working for him, <clears throat> and they didn't. They couldn't answer it because it's not mysterious answers and mysteries that we're trying to figure out. We want to know the Lord. Look at the name. The, the man to whom God will reveal his secrets. That's more than just knowing secrets. That's knowing the guy that's got them. <laughs> you know? And being able to, to, he trusts you to be able to share his heart and stuff. Well, that's not going to happen overnight. And it takes a while to even realize what, you, what you're in the middle of here. This is, you know, you, you go, this is not about Bible school or New Creation Fellowship Church. This is about, this isn't about... <clears throat> fixing people or having a big church or, or, or doing great things. This is about learning him and knowing him. And in doing that, even if you end up in a dungeon, it's going to work for you because you're going to be with him. And I mean, 
Think about it. The man to whom God would reveal his secrets, apparently he had already revealed it to him while he was in the dungeon. Okay, so is it possible that he could be in the dungeon and even though it's rough in there, he could be going, man, what the, the things that he is sharing with me, you know, turn to another prisoner or something. The things that he is saying, the things that when he opens his heart, when he opens the word, it's, it's heaven itself. I mean, look at Jesus. Jesus said, I must go to heaven. No, he never said that. I must go to my father. He always said, I'm going to my father. He never went, yeah, I want to go to heaven and I'm going to be going soon, you know. And it's nice up there. And some of y'all aren't going to be coming because you're mean. And say that, all he had was one thing on his mind. I want to go to my father. And you have Paul and Peter and some of these guys come along and they, they are, you know, like Paul is writing there in Romans and it's just, writing out what the Holy Spirit would had shown him of the Father's heart and of Jesus. Just writing it down. And he just stops and he just, I can just see him put down his pen and go, oh, the depth, both the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of it, the glory, you know, he's just like, whoa. Well, how do you get there? Do you just go... You, you, you just go three years into Bible school and bingo? No. Just for the students, don't go to Bible school. In your heart, yeah, sit there. Don't go to Bible school in your heart. Go to Jesus. Make that everything, everything. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, still Genesis 45, I'll read that part again, verse 4. Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. And that's amazing because <clears throat> the... Um, the word that came to Joseph, part of it was <clears throat> there's going to be seven blessed years and seven lean years. And after, you know, in those lean years, is, there's going to be a famine, a famine of the word of God. You remember that being said in the scriptures? It's going to be a famine. <clears throat> and so, you know, Pharaoh could go, well, we better... Eat, eat a lot now <laughs> for when it's gone or something. You know, I mean, any kind of, of um, self-centered conclusions. Or Joseph says, let's store up enough. Let's, let's take all this abundance that's coming and let's not just make ourselves good. Let's put it in storehouses because the world is going to need somebody that's going to preserve life. Preserve life. All right. During the famine, during the famine, do you think that there was anywhere on the earth, if this was a worldwide famine, do you think there was any place on the earth <clears throat> where there were people who had lived, you know, rich, they had a nice you know, spread, and they had a nice house and all this kind of stuff. And people that were poor or people that, you know, were scared or just evil came to the house, broke in, took everything that they had stored up and saved up for, just for themselves and took it away. Do you think that ever happened anywhere on the earth? Well, yeah, yeah. They're not thinking, let's preserve life. You know, it's like, let's kill them and take what we can get. Though that would be 
That would be normal. But God sent Joseph to preserve life. Not just to feed people, not just to have a, 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 a food pantry. <laughs> it's a really big food pantry there, you know. Not just that, but to preserve life. That's a spirit. That's a spirit. It's, it's how do you describe it? You, you can say all these different ways that, he, you know, Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Um, have you ever really looked at that? Have you ever really looked at those verses? Because he actually tells you what the abundant life is. So I won't because if I, if I answer everything for you, then you'll never look anything up. <clears throat> Um, so while Joseph's immediate statement and outcome brings hope and promise in the here and now, yet the brother's action toward Joseph will have a similar effect of that of Sarah toward Hagar. In other words, in the future, the seed of Joseph's brothers, which is the nation of Israel, that grows up in Egypt, Egypt will swallow them up and make them um, what? Slaves and captives and workers building the pyramids and all that stuff. Uh, so, and they will reenact the trials of what happened both with Joseph and with Hagar. It's going to be another reenactment. Joseph was the first reenactment of what, it, what happened. But then the brothers had to reap, and so while they're in Egypt, there raises up a person who doesn't know the Pharaoh that, that loved Joseph. And he, he makes slaves out of them. He fears them. He, you know, mistreats them. <clears throat> All right. So... They will reenact the trials of what happened to both Joseph and Hagar. Oppression will be their lot in life. Because of the oppression <clears throat> Joseph had endured, they will endure also in the person of their future children who become in bondage in Egypt also. Indeed, God did send Joseph before them to preserve life, but that was only one of the reasons. God also specifically sent Joseph down into Egypt, Egypt so that his brothers too would experience Egyptian affliction as he and Hagar had. What will that consist of? It will involve slavery, oppression, bondage, and exile from their land. I'm sure it's in here, but you know, one of, the, one of the commandments that God gave to Israel was that don't mistreat the stranger that comes into your land. Did you know that? That's, you know, don't oppress them. Wow. <clears throat> okay. Um, I don't know how effective this chart will be. Certainly, I've Let me read it. You may not be able to follow it, but it is, this, it is basically this. Sarah uh, oppresses Hagar with, with her child and her. Her child is an Ishmaelite and she is an Egyptian. Joseph's brother, which is Israel, oppressive, oppresses Joseph. Ishmaelites carried Joseph to Egypt. See, each one of these shows the oppression and then the result. Egyptians, oppression of Joseph. Uh, I think I got this out of order here, but maybe not. Israel exalt, exalted by Joseph. Okay. Egyptians appro, uh, oppress Israel before the exodus. So 
whether you can fully comprehend that, there's a straight path of, of proof of whoever oppresses down the road, it's going to turn on them and they're going to be oppressed. Okay, that's the principle. This is just the, the, the people who were involved in it. But it shows it one after another after another all the way to the end of the book of Genesis. <clears throat> all right. Uh, let's talk about harsh circumstances. Harsh circumstances. Okay, so, so, so now we want to see that um, oppression... Like, like if there's someone here and they're being oppressed by someone over here, the, the only thing going on is not just oppression. Amen. God's also at work. God is always at work if we'll let him. Okay. So up to this point now, we've pretty much talked about the negative side of oppression. But now, now just let's call to remembrance Hagar, who was being oppressed, and it wasn't all just oppression, was it? She met God. He called her by name. She named him something particular. Um, uh, he gave her promises based on if she'll go back and, and go through that in a right spirit, right? That's what we've been studying. That's the picture. But now we're going to look at it in a positive manner. And that is harsh circumstances are required to prove the firstborn. And the firstborn is Christ in us. Right? You're not the firstborn. I'm not the firstborn. But in the Old Testament, I have used different people and called them the firstborn because they manifested things that were the nature of Christ. But they were really weren't the firstborn. It was a picture of that which was to come, the firstborn. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so the road to being exalted as the firstborn demands that the born son be proven concerning his ways. In other words, he's a born son, but he's not a firstborn until his ways have been proven. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, let's, let's just use Hagar because we, that's the main one we've been on. The way proven is used um, is in terms of God sending her back and saying, you know, submit, okay? Well, let's say uh, Israel going, or Joseph going down into Egypt. And he goes down into Egypt and it's harsh treatment. And from, from a reap what you sow view of that, that's just the sowing of what Sarah or the brothers, either one, had sown. I mean, that's just the reaping, I mean, of the, what the brothers had sown. <clears throat> but on God's point of view... He allows that because he's trying to prove, and let me just say it like this. He's trying to prove who is the firstborn. Okay, who is the firstborn? So um, uh, we went through uh, the prodigal son. We went through Cain and Abel. We went through the Exodus, actually, where we saw that God delivered the firstborn. Y'all remember that? That, that Moses told, or God told Moses, tell Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn, let my firstborn go. <clears throat> the proving is that spirit, handling it in the spirit of the Lamb, handling it rightly in the spirit of Christ. Um, and, you know, we all say that, we all know that, but, I mean, it gets into minute things because, you know, like I said, we can, we can go through it and we can submit, 
but we still bear all sorts of anger or unforgiveness or whatever. And, you know, and when we come out of it, we go, oh, praise God, I'm glad to be out of it. And, and God now is getting his firstborn son out of me. And he's going, you're not my firstborn son. That is not, that is not how you prove it. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Um, that, that your reactions and your um, fixed um, views have not been challenged so that you're still holding on to you and you're still holding on to your rights um, even though you submit. And see, now, since I understand that, I would never go, I would never go into a situation like that and still hold on to my rights unless, unless I just didn't want God to get his son. But if I wanted God to get his son, I would go, you know what? I'm with you, Lord. Do whatever you have to do. Show up whatever you have to show. Because what's he going to do? Whatever he shows up, he's going to replace it with his son. If there's an openness there, that's what he's going to do. It's not like, you know, well, I'll show you this. And he goes, you're out of there. He's like, let's clean it up and put the son in there. I mean, that's really his heart. I mean, it is. And, you know, some of y'all really don't know his heart yet, but that's his heart. You know, so many areas, there's no fear to have if you know the father and you know his relationship and his desire for the son. But if you don't, you know, then, then you, well, you wrestle or you hold back or you, you know, um, I mean, there are examples coming to my mind, but. You know, we, I mean, we just don't know him. We don't know him. And so, and the other part of that is, of course, is that we're holding on to things because, well, I want to be, I want to be something, or I want, uh, I want my ministry to flourish, or I want people to respect me, or I want to, you know, I want to be honored, but, you know, as some, a man or woman of God, or all this stuff that is a horrible compromise of the treasure that it is Christ. Horrible compromise. Well, okay, so when he gets that, he goes, you're, you're not my firstborn. Do you understand that? I mean, you know, the elder son in the prodigal son story. Perfect example. So perfect. I mean, he's supposed to be the firstborn because he was the firstborn in birth order, but he's supposed to be the firstborn prodigal son goes off and you know he's messing up and everything and while he's doing all that stuff he's not the firstborn either so the fa the father's going well i'd really like to get my son i'd really like to get my son out of you out of one of you you know um and then the prodigal comes back and he's still not right do you understand that he comes back and he says he says, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Well, you're not worthy to be called my son in terms of the son because you're still just trying to get right instead of trying to get him. I got to get right. <laughs> you know, even that proves that you're not right because you're striving, you know. And so... You know, he's, he, he comes back and he already says, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go to my father. But see, that's the, the born son saying that, not the firstborn. He was born into the family, right? Prodigal son was part of the family. Elder son was pro part of the family. Father in the middle, elder son, prodigal son. They're born into the family, they're, so you could say they're born again, but neither one of them are displaying the spirit of the son that he once brought forth. Does that make sense? And so, you know, so then the prodigal comes back and then the father realizes that even though, you know, I mean, even though he's maybe saying it wrong, there's maybe some hope here because he's come, he came back and he, um, 
and he's trying in the sense of trying to figure out what might be the issue. And so before he can even really say it all, the father starts, he puts the ring on his finger. Just go through the Old Testament and look at what the ring means. Even the book of Esther. Go through there and see what that thing means, okay? He puts the ring on him. He puts his garment on him. Look through that. Go through that. Look what that looks like in different stories. And because um, that, that's being clothed with Christ now. And so the father's treating him like he is the firstborn, putting all that stuff on him. And the prodigal knows that he's not that in himself and that he'll never be that in himself. He's just going to be a born-again Christian. You see what I'm saying? But then the father takes him over and says, okay, let's bring the fatted calf. Bring the bullock. And as I said, I mean, I believe it because it matches every story that I've seen since then. That had to be a sacrifice, and there had to be the father explaining, look, this is the family spirit. This is who you are. This is who I am. This is who we are. And this, you know, and, you know, you remember in many of the sacrifices, they, they cope you know, cut open the sacrifice and they take the inward parts and they show it to God and they show it, you know, like, God, I, I want your inward parts. <laughs> you know? The inward parts of the lamb. And then he shows it to his son. And all of a sudden, somewhere, bingo, because they're both rejoicing together and making merry together. That means that the son jumped rails on being a born-again son, and now it's the firstborn son, and his father's dancing. You go, wow! I mean, you know, it's possible. It's possible. See, we go, well, I don't know, I'm really messed up. Yeah, you really are. Oh, wait, there's more. But... <laughs> But the father, the father, see, he won't strive with flesh forever, but he will strive a long time with if he thinks that somebody really deep down wants the son. So you go, well, I've been trying for, you know, four years. Keep wanting the son because you can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. All right. Uh, I didn't get very far into this uh, harsh circumstances required to prove the firstborn. Uh, and I think it will be valuable to put together all the things that are there and hopefully we can do that by all right wait a minute by the end of uh, next class but you know it just really is it all seems so complicated, I mean, in our minds, because our minds are not um, uh, built to, to contain all knowledge like God. He's all-knowing. We'll never be all-knowing. You know, I remember when I came to that, when I was, you know, a pastor over on Bolivar, and, you know, I thought, man... You know, I'm supposed to know how to fix this and how to do that and then this and this and this. And I was going, man, you know, so I was striving to become all-knowing so that I would be a good pastor or a good Christian, you understand? And I realized, wait a minute, I don't think I'm ever supposed to be all-knowing. I think he's supposed to and I'm supposed to check in with him. I'm supposed to, you know, he's the vine and I'm supposed to be a branch. 
and I'm supposed to live like that. And it really started reforming me because I was just like, uh, you know, there is so much to all of this. There is so much. And, um, you know, and you, you can just strive and strive and strive. But it's the heart. It's the heart. It's when you go, you know what? You know, I mean, the Lord even said, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He didn't say, get all knowledge. It's a spirit. And, and you say, Lord, I, I, I've heard definitions from Kelly or Randy or this person, Jim, or somebody else. And, but definitions only help if you're studying the book of 1 Peter. Um, they really, you know, I mean, our, so, someone who has seen, really seen the Lord can never impart that simply by talking. Can't do it. That person can go into a death. You understand that? They can go into a death and out of that death can come life for others. Death worketh in me, but life in you. Remember, Paul said that. But you, you know, you can't just get it in classes. Um, I'm sure y'all do this a lot, but for me, I, you know, I remember uh, studying outside of the class and beyond subjects that they were saying regularly. That was a huge part of my thing. I mean, we'd gone to, we went to Bible school together and, and uh, years and years later, um, actually in relationship to the Bolivar Church, um, there was a man who was over the school at Berean and so I decided to try to get my transcript. And he sat down and went through the papers because he had all that. Went through the papers and he said, Randy, you went you went to get a bachelor's and you got a master's degree because uh, you studied, you went to so many classes. <laughs> and I went, I did? Because I wasn't, master's degree was not at all in my mind, nor do I care now. I wanted the Lord and I was digging and I was just hungry and just, Lord, I'm an idiot. I can't see. Open my eyes. Open my heart. Bring me in. Bring me into what's important to you, not just what's important to me. And I'm, my prayers are probably all wrong right now, so forget those and do what you know you've got to do. <laughs> you know? Don't you think he would probably hear that prayer more than, well, I know what I need, and it's, here's a list. <laughs> here's my list, Lord. I'm leaving this with you. And I don't, you know. But if you, really, if you really love the Lord, you really want the Lord, then start letting it reach your heart. Amen? Is that okay? Can we pray? Father, we just long uh, to, to be lined up with you. And we know that our works aren't going to do that. And we know that... Um, that by studying, we're not going to get that. But we know that we have to search the scriptures and we know that we need to and we know that if our hearts are searching them for you and not to figure everything out, that you will, you will want to reveal your son and continue to reveal him in us and in the word. So, Father, I just pray, I pray particularly over our students, Father, that I believe they have hungry hearts. I believe that they are, um, have things in them that you know um, that can be touched at the right time to be drawn in more. So I pray for all of our students, Lord, that you would that you would bring them in in your timing and that you would, you would quicken, quicken that thing in them that is like a, setting a fire in them and sending them forth, Lord, in your, in your heart and in your um, 
and your plan, your way, your nature. And Father, for the rest of us, I just pray we all continue to, to surrender. Surrender, quit fighting, quit trying to keep stuff, quit trying to justify stuff, quit trying to make stuff work that'll never work. Lord, we're just wearing ourselves out for nothing. And bring us into the heart that is your son. The true spirit of the lamb, not just the lamb teaching. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.